Every great investment you've ever made started with the right connections. Connections to the world's most sought after investment community dedicated to improving business and society. You are part of this community. Welcome to iConnections Global Alternatives Conference. In eight short months, managers and allocators who control a combined 60 trillion in assets have used our platform. But as you know, there's more to our story. Funds for Food was the largest capital introduction conference of 2020, facilitating over 3,000 meetings with the industry's most sophisticated investors, while also raising nearly $2 million supporting those in need during the pandemic. We followed this with Fund Women Week, the largest capital introductions conference in 100 Women in Finance's history. Initiatives like these are at the heart of iConnection's mission. In early 2022, we will combine the latest in virtual and in-person participation at the world-famous Fountain Blue Hotel Miami. You are part of this community because you are the people with the vision to improve society. Invest in progress. Welcome to the world of iConnections. Hello everyone, I'm Ron Biscardi, the CEO of iConnections. I'd like to thank all of you for participating in this year's Global Alternatives Conference. This is our first year hosting this event, and of course, it's virtual. But we are looking forward to our first in-person Global Alt event, which will be held at the Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami Beach during Hedge Fund Week in January 2022. This event will feature world-class content, prepared by the iConnections Investment Institute, followed by two days of one-on-one -on -one capital introduction meetings, which we project will number over 10,000. This event will be free for allocators and open to managers who are members of the iConnections platform. So if you're not already a member, please go to iConnections.io to learn more. Thank you for joining us and stay safe and healthy. Welcome to the iConnections Global Alternatives Conference. I am Joe Cassano, audit partner at Witham, a top-ranked public accounting and advisory firm. Witham is delighted to be involved in the iConnections ecosystem. iConnections was founded in 2020 with an aim to keep the alternative investment community connected through high-quality virtual events and networking. During a time where making connections has been challenged, the iConnections platform is helping to keep our industry connected. I am particularly excited to introduce today's session as the focus on social media technology firms is top of mind. As a technology forward thinking firm, today's event resonates for us at Witham, and we're thrilled that Tristan Harris is here to share his insights. Tristan is president and co-founder of the Center for Humane Technology. He is the primary contributor to the 2020 hit, The Social Dilemma, which is the first documentary to ever top the Netflix charts. Previously, Tristan worked at Google, developing a framework for how technology should ethically steer the thoughts and actions of billions of people from screens. Rolling Stone magazine named him one of the 25 people shaping the world, and he was named in Fortune's 40 Under 40 for his work on reforming technology. Tristan will be interviewed by Helen Lewis, a staff writer at The Atlantic and former associated editor at The New Statesman. She is the author of Difficult Women, A History of Feminism in 11 Fights, and also the host of BBC Radio 4 show, The Spark. Hello, and welcome to this iConnections and Intelligence Squared event with me, Helen Lewis. I'm delighted to introduce our guest today. Tristan Harris is the president and co-founder of the Centre for Human Technology, an organisation dedicated to reimagining our digital world. He previously worked as a design ethicist at Google and was a leading contributor to the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma. Today's event is going to run for 45 minutes. About the first 30 minutes, I'm going to be in conversation with Tristan. And then in the second part, we're going to be taking your questions. So let's take it away. Tristan, I want to start off with the current moment that we're living through. Uh, we saw a pro-Trump mob storming Capitol Hill on January the 6th, many of whom were believers in QAnon, a conspiracy theory about, well, pretty much everything really, but a very dangerous one. Uh, we then saw the US president at the time, Donald Trump, removed from various tech platforms from Facebook to Twitter for inciting that mob. What did you think as you saw all of that happening? Yeah, um, well, Helen, first, thanks for, for having me to see you again. Um, uh, 
You know, I was still on vacation when January 6th happened, um, and I tuned in to see originally, you know, the, the runoff in the Georgia uh, state um, elections, and uh, just hours later, seeing um, the situation unfold at the Capitol, and you know, was texted by so many people who had seen the social dilemma. So, you know, because the social dilemma spoke to the concern that social media would be driving polarization to a degree, polarization, conspiracy thinking, a breakdown of our shared reality. And then there's a point in the film when Tim Kendall, who uh, created Facebook's business model says, well, you know, he's asked, what are you worried about in the short term? And he pauses for a long moment and he says civil war. And I remember a lot of people when seeing the social dilemma, feeling like that was kind of a, uh, a horror story about a possible fictional future, not something that would be a, a not not what was represented as a very real and present concern. Um, and which, by the way, that that line I think was filmed in, I think the end of 2019, uh, in terms of kind of how early uh, we were all feeling that this is a, this is what was is, is kind of the end game of this process, a business model that profits from putting each of us into narrower and narrower. Um, more righteous realities than which we feel more and more correct about our views. Um, because every time you flick your finger, if the business model is attention, they profit from affirmation, not from challenging your worldview uh, information. Um, so, you know, going back to the moment on January 6th, I saw what was happening. And my first reaction is that as an American citizen, it's just, this is horrible. Uh, you know, it's so sad to see this, this take place. And on the other hand, it's completely not surprising. Um, What's interesting is watching the very different realities that the people who showed up that day were living in. You have some people who are the Oath Keepers, you have the QAnon uh, people, you have the people who simply genuinely believe that the election was stolen from them. So, you know, the idea that they're the insurrectionists or they're the seditionists, they say, no, 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 it's the opposite. We're the patriots. We're the ones that are trying to make democracy really work for people. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is, you know, if you label people with a intention that they themselves don't have, like you say, for example, that all of them were white supremacists, um, because I think it's something like 70 or 80 percent of people of Republicans um, actually um, uh, don't believe that the election was legitimate. Um, you end up alienating everyone. Right. And I think what's so challenging is I'm not trying to in any way endorse what happened. I, I, I think what what happened was horrific. And there's what, I, what I'm trying to point attention to is the different realities that were all put together that then stormed the Capitol together, but each operating with a different basis of what was the history that got us here? Um, what is actually going on now? Is there a global pedophile elite in those halls that we have to take down? Is this the storm that we've been waiting for, the great awakening that's part of the QAnon narrative? Um, uh, and you feel like there's this increasing detachment from base reality that everyone is now operating in. And again, different detachments from reality. Each person is, is in a different narrow echo chamber. And I think you know, the obviousness of uh, this stuff that happens on social media, that what people are, are being fed um, has real world consequences. You know, This was the YouTube comment stream that was suddenly jumped out of the YouTube page and was grappling up the walls of the Capitol building. Um, so, you know, that's just to say, I think we we now have a cultural warp, a mind warp, a national psychosis where the mind is kind of divided against itself when we are not seeing the world the same way, the same way that a psychotic patient has different parts of their mind that are seeing the world in, in different ways and are in conflict with each other. That's, I think, the, the situation we need to point our attention to. Because obviously, while the business model of social media depends on perpetuating that narrowing of our views of reality, um, we have to fix that. At this point, is now metastasized into a cultural cancer where it, those beliefs are now running in us. And so um, I think we need to realize that we're now 10 years into this mind warping process. And we need to kind of give ourselves the cultural antibodies to wake up from this illusion and to uh, really make ourselves immune to the way that social media will continue to, to drive us crazy. Uh, and yeah. we've never done that before. It's a new situation in history. I, I find that a really interesting period to observe from this side of the Atlantic, because as you say, my, one of my instinctive reactions after horror was, uh, well, at least now it is going to be much easier to make the case that this isn't just some stuff that's happening on the internet, right? And and that was always a big barrier to getting people to say, for example, take QAnon seriously, is that it sounds like 
wacky ideas about, you know, Satanists in pizza restaurants. Like, how do we take this stuff seriously? And you, well, you actually, if you think about it, if you think about yourself in the mindset of somebody who is who has found out there is a huge conspiracy at the heart of the US government, then you would want to do something about it, right? That in your own mind, you are the hero of that that story. And it's important to put yourself in the in the shoes of those people. But again, the other thing that I thought was really fascinating was that the social media companies really did change. Like you and I last spoke about this a couple of years ago. And I thought at the time, well, there's nothing. There's I, you know, it is not in the commercial interest of these companies to to change. So that is, the only thing that's really going to work here is social pressure. But when we saw Donald Trump's Twitter account revoked, you know, and his Facebook access revoked, how optimistic are you about that as a sign that there are clear enforceable rules that a majority of people will accept? Okay, so it won't spring people off into thinking this is an anti-conservative bias now from social media companies. Mm -hmm. And that there is a kind of consistent idea that there is a social responsibility element of running a big social media business as well as a commercial one. Yeah, there's so many things there. So one I want to name, I think we're in the middle of this process by which the longer this machine runs, the more divided our psyche and our different ways of seeing reality becomes, which means the harder it is to agree on the actions that platforms should take, because we actually are coming at it from these different realities, meaning that the cancer infects the mindset of the people who have to make the final judgment on is it legitimate to take down Donald Trump? Because well, what was the election result? Was it rigged? Was it not rigged? And the more it keeps affecting us, there's this sort of circular feedback loop that makes it harder and harder to agree. I remember when I was brought onto MSNBC, um, the left-oriented um, uh, TV news channel in the United States, I was um, asked, why was Twitter labeling um, Trump's tweets at the time, this was about two weeks after the election, as disputed that he um, uh, said that he won the election. He said the election was disputed was the label that Twitter added. He said, that's ridiculous. We, they should just say that Trump, that Trump lost the election. Um, and, and the point being that if you're on the left, you think it's this one obvious clear case. If you're on the right, you believe it's this other uh, case that at least it's disputed or it was rigged or there's questions about it. And again, it just demonstrates the fact that as we try to adjudicate what is true, that we need human minds to be uh, seeing reality in the same way. So that's just important to call out as we make those decisions. Now, in terms of the deplatforming of Trump, um, you know, that action, uh, as much as many people feel like it was overdue, also polarized 70 million people into thinking that the platforms are now part of this left power grab, um, that now the tech companies are part of a you know, political left government that has now seized power with the government, is now extending that power with the tech company. They can paint this narrative that makes it seem as if this is actually a political action. And, and that to me is very worrisome because I actually don't believe that was the motivation behind what happened. Um, if you go back in time, there was an account on Twitter called at suspend the press. Uh, I don't know if you know about this account, but all it did was post the exact same text on Twitter that President Trump tweeted. So no matter what he posted, it would just post the exact same thing. And the question was, would that account get suspended for saying the same thing that Trump was saying? And multiple occasions, it got locked, labeled, regulated, uh, I think, taken down um, because of the fact that it was saying things that actually violated the terms of use, which demonstrates that Twitter wasn't enforcing its own policy uh, on the president's account and giving him an exception. So already, according to Twitter's own rules, it had not been enforcing its rules. So there's a, a longstanding history here of whether or not it should have banned Trump. Now, of course, because Twitter is operating essentially 3 billion Truman shows, or at least as many users as it has, each of us get our own narrow reality. Um, it has to, um, they have to make a judgment about which, which things they're going to ban or take down. They don't have enough moderators, basically, right? So if you think about uh, the civil war sort of situation that's happening in Ethiopia and the conflict there and the, the different languages that are spoken in Ethiopia, there's something like six major dialects and languages and they're, and they're on Twitter. And um, uh, does Twitter have the moderators to be able to adjudicate those things in other languages? No. Do they have the moderators to take down the egregious speech by, um, you know, accounts in Iran that are saying hateful things or inciting violence. They don't have a kind of global state department, these tech companies, to look for the kinds of conditions in which we would deplatform voices from all across the world, according to the same logic and norms. And moreover, that's all being decided from, um, you know, one Western country, the United States, without the cultural knowledge of these other places. I'm bringing all this up because I want to orient us into the situation of we have a handful of technology companies based in the US, as I said, the social dilemma, the first presentation in 2012, um, 
that are making decisions on behalf of, of 2 billion or 3 billion people without the cultural knowledge or even capacity to adjudicate each decision um, fairly, let's call it. I think if we want this moment to not lead to more polarization in the belief that these platforms are in the pocket of one political party, this moment calls for almost um, a digital, like a constitutional convention for the digital world, because we really are now, I think, you know, especially when the tech platforms took down Parler um, and, and Amazon Web Services and Apple and Google all took down the infrastructure for an entire web company. Um, I mean, they'll turn it into Twitter, which is Parler. That demonstrated the flexing of the muscles of big tech, that they really do govern so much of the access that you have and what it means to be able to participate in the digital democratic society that we now live in. And if we want these actions to not be perceived as partisan, we need to show that there's a consistent constitution that we are operating from. And that constitution cannot be autocratically decided by Jack Dorsey waking up you know, one day in Tahiti and saying, I think now's the day we're going to digitally impeach Donald Trump. Um, just like Nancy Pelosi can't wake up one day from Tahiti and say, you know, today I think I'm just going to get rid of the president. But there's two ways to fail here. One way to fail is not having articles of digital impeachment, meaning not having conditions upon which you would say, hey, this person is inciting violence and led to an insurrection. Um, so that's one way to fail is lawlessness and wild west. But the other way to fail is autocratic decision making that's reactionary coming from two or three technology CEOs. So I say that because I think what we really need is some kind of democratic process, just like the constitution is a trusted document in the US for how we work out our problems. Um, we need something like that for the digital world and, and what better time than now, as I think we witnessed the birth of a new digital nation. I'm very excited to hear the words constitutional convention, last heard in the musical Hamilton, of course. The, uh, which made the idea of constitutional convention sexy. But that's, yeah, that's really interesting to me because it, you can see similar ideas that around the world, for example, uh, Ireland had a referendum on abortion, an incredibly divisive subject. And it preceded that with a constitutional convention, a citizens assembly. It got people together to hear loads of expert evidence and that informed the process. And then the resulting uh, referendum was passed by two thirds majority. So, you know, you had a proper democratic seal of approval on what happened there. And, people and really it was done- that, right, people really, really changed their people minds. People really did go through a process, and people who were conservative, they really heard different points of view, and they actually, so I didn't mean to interrupt you, Helen, but it's such a good example. I, I think that Ireland is, is, is exactly the kind of thing we'd be modeling ourselves after here. But I, yeah, and I think it's one of the ones that I bring up most often because nobody, I mean, there are some people, a very small number of people who felt that they lost or that this was injurious to them, but everybody got to have their say. And, you know, th there was an acceptance that, you know, that, that the majority does win the day. But I want to take you back to the kind of origin story, because we talk about these things. and I agree with you. You know, it is kind of crazy that about five people are making these decisions on behalf of humanity. Can you talk us through how we got, how do we get from Mark Zuckerberg in his dorm room deciding he wants to rate how hot people are to where we are now? Like, well, how does that happen? Yeah, I believe Elon Musk, after January 6th, posted a, a photo of dominoes where the first domino that fell was um, a website in which you can rate girls in your college and leads to capitalist, a capital insurrection, you know, 10 year, 20 years later. So how do we get there? So, um, well, I, I, there's, there's a lot of different angles we can take here. But the thing that all these technology companies share, as we talk about in The Social Dilemma, is that they are all competing for human attention. And there's only so much human attention out there. Um, so, uh, you know, essentially it becomes this race to the bottom of the brainstem to figure out what are things I can create, what are persuasive impacts I can dangle in front of your nervous system. Things like social validation, you've got two new likes, but if you pull to refresh again, like a slot machine, maybe you'll get 20 new likes and I'll just refresh it, you know, five seconds from now. Um, so we, we find these different tricks essentially to persuade you. And, and this, Helen, you and I talked about this two years ago, I, I studied, uh, as part of there's a, there's a lab at Stanford called the Persuasive Technology Lab. I took their class called the uh, Stanford Behavior Design class with Professor BJ Fogg, um, who's a very good person, by the way, and who has not tended for some technology to uh, get out of hand. But uh, yeah, I studied in that class with the founders of Instagram, Mike Krieger, um, uh, Kevin Sister, earlier, of course, and many other people who were uh, part of um, that class, that lab, that understanding, later joined the ranks of these technology companies. And I'm bringing this up because I think instead of seeing uh, these social media companies as arbitrary technologies that are like any other technology. You know, I've got, uh, you know, headphones here or, you know, a mouse. Um, and these are just technologies. But this mouse, as an example, this is not persuasive. The mouse doesn't have an AI that's using all this learning and big, big data to figure out what is it, what can it do to like wiggle a certain way to get me to use it and to give me some kind of lights and rewards. And if it knows that 
I respond to red lights and not blue lights or green lights, or if it can show me that my friend also picked up their mouse five seconds ago, maybe I want to pick up the mouse. It doesn't do anything. It's just sitting here patiently as a tool waiting to be used. And that's just a tool-based technology environment. And we've moved to a manipulation and persuasive technology-based environment because of the fact that these technologies, uh, these social media companies rely on human attention as their fuel. The more attention they get, the more money they make because that means more time against advertising. And it turns out that this race to the bottom of the brainstem just goes lower and lower into our amygdala, into outrage. So outrage plays better in getting us coming back for more, showing us that we're right instead of that we're wrong or challenging our... If you, every time you flick your finger, if it challenged your worldview, you wouldn't stay nearly as long as every time you flick your finger if it confirms your worldview and says, yes, you're even more right. And here's yet another reason why you're angry. What, we, what do we add to that race? We add AI. So we, instead of just showing you... Um, you know, random content, we can actually generate um, the perfect thing for you because behind that slab of glass is a supercomputer pointed at your brain that basically, because it's seen so many other people who just watched the video you just watched, and it's it's known exactly what other videos did it show other people next that caused them to stay there the longest. It's played out all those simulations. So when you flick your finger and you think, I should, I'm just going to watch one more video because I, I have self-control, you don't realize that your prefrontal cortex is up against a supercomputer pointed at your brain that has seen trillions of examples of other people's behavior. And it knows exactly what kind of thing it can show you that could keep you there. And so that's the asymmetry, the growing asymmetry of power we see between technology knowing something about us that we don't know about ourselves, which, by the way, is the same principle in persuasion and in magic, which is my other background as a kid, is as a magician, is the magician knows something about your mind that is deceptive to how you, your mind will make meaning that you don't know about yourself. That's the key to making the magic work. If you knew the thing that the magician knows about your mind, then it wouldn't work because you would know what the magician is doing. Um, so when you suddenly realize that we're now surrounded by this digital environment in which technology knows more and more about us increasingly uh, about us than we don't know about ourselves, it's getting more and more money. And where does that money go? It gets reinvested into bigger supercomputers that then have more data that then can calculate more moves ahead on the chessboard of your mind. There's this sort of checkmate process where the technology really is sucking people in to this whole persuasive environment that, again, is predicated on human attention. And so where does that lead to polarization on January 6th? Uh, you have essentially, um, uh, you know, here, here's a couple of facts. So Facebook has this recommended groups feature. So when you join one group on Facebook, it recommended other groups to you. You've probably all seen this. In fact, in 2018, um, Mark Zuckerberg actually set the, the new goal of Facebook uh, from, if you remember, the goal was make the world more open and connected to uh, as of t January or February 2018, it was to bring the world closer together. And he literally said in his memo, you can go back and see Mark Zuckerberg's memo, the way we're going to bring the world closer together is with Facebook groups. And he said, we built the AI actually recommend groups for people so that if you were joined a football club, we would know to join a sewing club. That's probably not such a good example because those two are not as, as likely, but you, you get the picture that it's predicting groups that you might want to join. Now you flash forward to 2020 and a Wall Street Journal bombshell piece comes out last year saying that when Facebook's own engineers looked at extremist groups, it found that 64% of the extremist groups, the QAnon groups, the Oath Keepers, the violent groups, 64% uh, of the groups that people joined were because Facebook's own recommendation system had served it to them. Okay, so um, an example of this, my friend Rene Diresta, who actually worked with the Senate Intelligence Committee on the, the Russia investigation, um, uh, showed because she was a new mom and she joined a baby food group, a, a group on Facebook where you, moms who make their own baby food, like organic baby food, do it yourself, anti-coercion, kind of uh, fresh, natural, hippie way of going about being a mom. And uh, you think that's a great positive use of Facebook, and it is. But then what do you think the most recommended Facebook group was when it said, hey, you should join these other groups and here's a list of them? What was the top recommended group? I mean, my ha my initial hazard of a guess would be something about anti-vaccination, right? Because it's anti-science. Exactly. That's exactly right. So it's anti-vaccine, uh, the anti-vaccine conspiracy theory group for moms. And then once you join one of those, what did it tend to recommend next? And it was things like Pizzagate or Chemtrails or QAnon. And you know, what we about conspiracy theory literature is the best predictor of whether you'll believe in a new conspiracy theory is whether you already believe in one. Because conspiracies, what they do is they warp your trust for what is true in the world, right? If, if the government really is behind 9-11, if, you know, if we really didn't go on the moon, if the moon, if the moon landing really was fake, um, and we've, we've, got all, we've seen all these satellite photos and Carl Sagan and the blue dot and all that, if all of that is constructed, 
it's like suddenly it turns your whole mind upside down because you view the whole world with this new kind of skepticism. And so QAnon is this kind of meta conspiracy theory that's kind of internalized the lizard people and the pedophiles and the flat earth and these things, and these things grow and metastasize. And we now have a world where, you know, I just got off a call with, um, you know, a Senator, uh, in the, in the United States and, and QAnon has now basically taken over, um, huge portions of one of the major parties. So this is not some kind of niche thing that a few people got steered into. This is now a mainstream political movement that hopefully is being increasingly uh, questioned because of the fact that it's never come true. And um, increasingly with Joe Biden becoming uh, sworn, getting sworn in, it hasn't come true. Um, but but you, you know, when you study the literature on conspiracy thinking and prophecies, Leon Festinger's work of When Prophecies Fail, you, know, the, uh, you get into this world where um, it people, it's very hard once you've entered into these belief systems to ever exit. And what we really need are a kind of a cultural immune system to exit out of this, this mind warping machine, which is now where we find ourselves. I think that's the thing that people find it quite hard to, to understand. Um, you know, Anne Applebaum wrote a piece for The Atlantic about kind of coexistence is the only answer, looking at post-conflict societies. And that's the, that's the huge problem is it, it, it is not very helpful for liberals to go, wow, you people are stupid. How could you believe all this stuff about yeah. pedophiles? Because it's not going to be very convincing to, as you say, somebody whose whole universe is now built around this stuff. You need a kind of gentle off-ramp in the way that you've got a probably quite a gentle on-ramp. Um, I don't know about you, but I found the New York Times' rabbit hole series fascinating to see yeah. how people went from, you know, the, the YouTube recommendation algorithm took them down this, this journey path. And I had that experience when I interviewed Jordan Peterson, who's quite a well-known, uh, you know, conservative cultural commentator. I got people saying, well, like I watched your interview with him and I previously, all I'd watched on YouTube was guitar tutorials. And now it's giving me like, you know, feminism debunked again and again and again. And I'm sure if they'd watched that, then it would have given them something slightly stronger and so on and so on. That's right. Um, I, I find all this stuff kind of very depressing, but you're in the business of changing it. So you must be pretty optimistic that it can change. Yeah. Um, and Apologies, because it, it can be very depressing. And, um, it, you know, I think the other thing that we all thought looking at January 6th was we've, we've all been warning about this. And there's no told you so kind of effect here. It's just that we are all so concerned about this. We've been concerned about it for many years, as many people, researchers and hardworking uh, people in the community who've been studying these rabbit hole effects for a very long time. Um, so the first thought, I think, is also, you know, uh, how, how do we make sure that researchers and those who are spotting these harms get a, a more of a seat at the table and a front row? Pass to kind of changing these systems. Um, what makes me optimistic, I think, is that I think January 6th at least made visible and present for everyone that this has to change. This is real. This is not some kind of fictional story or a, a couple of niche examples of fringe groups. This has really uh, become a mainstream process that uh, we need to fix. So I think the thing that makes me optimistic is I think everyone now understands that. I think, you know, as an example, by the way, the film The Social Dilemma has been seen by 100 million people in 190 countries and in 30 languages. We have you know, heard just heads of state and congressional members from all over the world uh, you know, you know, using it as the base for um, uh, motivating conversations on regulation and, and so many other things. So I, I'm incredibly optimistic about the fact that the global culture seems to get that this problem uh, exists. The question about what to do with it, uh, what to do about it, um, to me, what I'm more worried about is how do we reverse our culture out of it? And I'm curious, I haven't read in Apple's article yet, but I'm a big fan of her work. Um, it, how, how do we escape a mind warp? What are periods in history where we did get kind of lost in a hysteria, uh, in different conspiracy rabbit holes, and we did kind of later wake up out of them? Uh, what were periods of division, hyper division, and hyper different views of what is real and what history we've all come from? where we kind of snapped out of that and had a shared uh, reality. I know there's things like the rally around the flag effect or shared common enemies. Uh, is there a way we can do this peacefully where we can actually exit this hyper-divisive period? I'm worried about this culturally because I think even if we had the perfect regulatory slate, like let's imagine we convened the members of Congress in the US and we got you know everyone in the EU together. We have the perfect um, adjustment to the business model. It's not like even with the perfect adjustment to the business model, there's snap your fingers and suddenly everyone harmoniously starts clicking on the same thing, agreeing about things, or solving our problems. Um, you know, I think we have a cultural problem, and until we collectively realize that we've that this is the this is the invisible thing that's been pulled over our eyes like the matrix to make us believe that we're more divided than we actually are. Uh, I think about groups like um, More in Common, which I believe is based in the UK, which does work on uh, showing the kind of 
uh, almost like an optometrist, uh, like a, a national optometrist who shows that our, our, we're all wearing glasses that show us where we think we disagree with each other and projects that out onto the world before we even interact with other people. We need ways of immediately finding what our common ground is and what we care about. Um, and getting ourselves out of the habit of cynicism and resentment and contradiction, which is kind of the default habit on social media now, where the, the initial way that we respond to anyone is to say, well, look at how hypocritical that is compared to this thing that they said before. Um, Oren Hoffman, someone I know, uh, posted a graph, he said, of, you know, when people put the tweet on that says, this aged well, and they'll, they'll tweet something and say, this aged well. This is like a, a screenshot of what someone said five years ago. He said, the number of times that people will be able to say this age well is only going to go up in the future because the whole point is human beings are messy and contradictory. And we're going to make statements that don't necessarily cohere with everything else that we've made. And I think instead of viewing that as, as, as um, ammunition for attacking each other, which is just going to lead to more conflict, we have to snap out of this conflict and divisive mentality and move towards realizing collectively this divisive force that's, that's been put on us. And realize that if we have any hope of competing with China and for the Western democracies to actually succeed, we have to get out of this divisive mode. Because while we're all just imploding and fighting on each other, uh, we are going to lose in the uh, long-term future. And especially, we'll not be able to meet problems like climate change. Well, before we get to audience questions, I want to ask you something that directly relates to the audience watching now, which is about you know, what advice would you give to investors who are looking to, you know, to, to support ethical technology development? Yeah, well, I think we need much more shareholder activism and, um, you know, uh, pressure. Now, one of the interesting things, not to make people depressed, but Mark Zuckerberg has a unique voting structure uh, on the company of Facebook and is immune even to what have already, there's already been many shareholder uh, activist sort of resolutions that have tried to change the business models or force them to do more on these, these key issues. And unfortunately, because he has unilateral sort of power, um, uh, or at least more voting power than than, than all the sh other shareholders, uh, th those things don't don't necessarily work. But it also gives him the chance to potentially act, were he to become sort of enlightened and, and wake up one day and realize that this was uh, such a problem. Um, you know, I think that more broadly, though, if I were talking to the investment community, I would ask, what are the business models that we are funding? What are the uh, financial incentives of the mainstream technologies operating on society? Because so long as this business model is commodifying and monetizing human attention, um, you can think of it like in the same way that, uh, you know, in the same way that a tree, so long as a tree is worth more as dead slabs of two by fours than as a living tree, human beings and your children are worth more as dead slabs of human behavior flicking like a zombie addicted, polarized, outraged, disinformed. That form of a human, that kind of dead, predictable, autonomous zombie human is worth more than a thriving child who's playing with their friends outside. It's worth more than a citizen who's reading with their free time instead of being sucked into the hyper present of Twitter outrage conflict. Um, we have to have a business model that doesn't turn us into and domesticate us into the kind of human being that is incapable of solving our problems. And so I would point people's attention to this advertising business model, which is at the root of TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, YouTube, uh, it, if you fix the business model, if you change that incentive, imagine a world where all those engineers at these technology companies go to work every day and they get to think about serving society as the customer and serving the individual as the customer. And that's what we really want. And one actor uh, who's especially in that position to make that economic shift is actually Apple and Google with the app stores. You can think of the app stores as kind of the federal reserve uh, or the central bank of the attention economy. And right now, they, they, they actually just recently, for the first time, flexed their power in a very uh, values-driven way, where they said to Parler, we are going to kick Parler out of our app store unless you have um, the kind of moderation capacities that are going to take off these extremists. And they did not demonstrate that capacity. And so Apple and Google did take off uh, Parler from, from their app store. They could, in this situation, say, we are going to not allow um, virality, engagement-based businesses, meaning businesses that depend on the virality of user-generated content, which is this commoditizing attention model, until they are able to meet these sort of safety threshold um, capacities. Just like we say, if you're building a plane in 60 seats and you only have five parachutes, that's not a safe plane. That's not, that's not falling in the safety thresholds. And if you are building a social media service with 3 billion unautomated Truman shows where they're programming to give people exactly what they want 
uh, or what will stimulate their nervous system, but not be good for the whole without having the, the moderation capacity to make sure that those are safe or not going to lead to conflict. They should not be allowed to operate in the app store. And that's an aggressive action, but I think we need something that's as aggressive as the problems that we now face. And Apple and Google with their app stores are actually a very interesting place that if investors could put their pressure on them, uh, could, could make a change like that happen. It's really interesting to talk about the particularly American nature of these tech companies, because that definitely informs it. For example, in, in Britain, it is our broadcast standard that you want to have a broadcast TV channel. It has a legal duty to be impartial. So the BBC yep. has to present both sides of the argument. And as a result, I, I so watch some American TV. A British TV is generally a lot more chilled out. <laughs> like you get a lot less angry watching it than you do either MSNBC or Fox, right? Because it's they're not. It's not polemic. It's 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 it, it has a public service remit. And yeah. so I think there are other countries apart from America that are much more easy with the idea that you operate in a regulatory environment. So that you know that, that corporations aren't people, and their free speech has to be limited in some ways. But there's another solution. This comes from a, an audience question. What do you think of the idea that some of these tech giants are just too big? Should we be breaking up Facebook? I mean, there's certainly a huge critique around concentrated economic power and the fact that that deadens innovation. You're not seeing alternative social media platforms um, being propped up. I mean, not that many, really, um, especially prior to... I like to say that I think the film The Social Dilemma actually has accelerated... Um, people's attempts to create alternative social media platforms, I think because people do realize now how destructive and divisive the existing ones are. But in general, one of the reasons that that hasn't happened is because the concentrated economic power of Facebook meant, I mean, look at WhatsApp and Instagram, they were both acquired by Facebook, because anytime you get big, these existing large companies just have the money to simply, you know, exit those smaller new competitors, those new entrants just back into the existing Borg machines that we've already built. Uh, so I think if we don't have some mechanism, uh, which is less about antitrust in my mind and more about enabling competition and ensuring thriving competition, um, it's important people would will, will obviously point out if you take a mallet and smash Facebook into 20 different Facebooks uh, or smash Twitter into five different Twitters, then you could just decentralize the kind of virality-based misinformation, biased harm that we're now seeing. And you're not solving the actual core problem of the business model, which is why, you know, in addition to attempts to deal with concentrated economic power, we have to have, frankly, a new protocol. It could go back to this digital constitutional convention idea. You know, you said that you have these broadcast standards and regulations and legal standards in the UK. If you were a broadcaster, you must be impartial. We used to have the fairness doctrine in the US. What does a fairness doctrine look like for networked information platforms? What does a networked information platform like a Facebook, like a Twitter look like if it is not thriving off the amygdala of the human brain, meaning the emotion centers of the human brain, what if we make business models that thrive on emotions simply illegal? Um, that's a very odd concept and kind of a sci-fi minority report like concept. But I think imagining what um, you know, my Walter Cronkite competing against your Walter Cronkite is a better world than my Tucker Carlson competing against your Tucker Carlson. Um, and I think that kind of competition, those kinds of standards, we need that for the 21st century digital democracies that we have to become. I mean, again, the, the strength of democracy is plurality. In fact, there are different views and different opinions, and that's going to defeat you know, a single person sitting in a room trying to imagine the best solution. But right now, we have a destructive form of plurality, and that's what our business models reward. The question is, what does it look like uh, constitutionally, legally, and social media design-wise to have constructive plurality? Uh, and, and that's really kind of the, the trillion-dollar question if we don't want to just let chi China sail past us uh, which I really worry about. I think the West has some real challenges to face if we're going to not uh, fall by the wayside. Yeah, I think that's. I think that is something again that has changed even in the last couple of years. Is a creeping awareness that there is another superpower out there with very different tech standards that we find, if you know, more terrifying than perhaps even um, the kind of stuff that's talked about in the social dilemma. Right, a very centralized control. The government can literally decides what it is that you're allowed to say and what subjects you're allowed to talk about or search for on the internet. Um, my second question from the audience is about screen time, which I think is something that worries particularly other parents. You know, this pandemic has meant that children in particular have you know, been homeschooled a huge amount more of screen time. Do you think this is going to have long-term consequences or, or or is that, you know, is and, and if so, how can they be ameliorated? It's a good question. Um, you know, it is a really hard time to be a teenager and, and a kid uh, when your primary means of communicating and being with your friends, if independent for most people. Uh, many, uh, I don't want to speak for all, but many people are at home or not able to attend school physically in person. 
you know, I think hopefully what the pandemic has made us all realize is that we are definitely social primates. We need touch. We need connection. We need eye contact. We need emotion. Um, and staring at a flat, you know, zoom fatigue, you know, screen, uh, for hours is, is certainly, I think more visibly against what would technology in it, you know, humanely would, would, would look like. And I think it's making it more visible. We, we like to say uh, at the center for humane technology that, um, you know, humane technology is about understanding the ergonomics of what it means to be human and the kind of healthy expression of what it means to be human. And much like ergonomics is not something you think about or care about if you're only sitting in an unergonomic chair for 10 minutes a day. You know, if you're in an unergonomic chair for 10 minutes, you don't really notice the fact that it's not really aligned with your back muscles. But if you have to sit in a chair for 10 hours a day, you start to really notice that there's a misalignment between your back and the way that that chair is designed. And I think that that's what the pandemic is hopefully making us realize uh, with screen time is that staring at flat screens for long periods of time uh, really just doesn't make us feel good. And I think that's now another shared common experience that we can pull from when we, when we talk about what post-pandemic a more humane technology world will look like, which is that it privileges um, you know, our ability to be with each other uh, in person or at least have a, a portfolio of balanced, embodied life uh, with each other and in, in connection than, than without. Now, to your question about what parents can do now in, in the world that we live in. I don't, I don't know if I have all the answers to that. I, I think um, we do need as much balance as we can get. I mean, it sounds so simple, but in my own life, finding uh, routines for going on hikes and being out in nature and breathing the fresh air and exercising and things like this, uh, anybody who can really ask themselves and tune into what are the habits that feel time well spent for me that actually align with a life well lived that you just feel better and more refreshed when you wake up and go to bed than uh, the habits that don't do that. And again, if you're schooling as a kid and your social connections and your gossip and your everything that is about growing up as a kid is based on social media, it's going to be harder and harder to do that. But however you can find that uh, in your life, I think is what uh, we need to, uh, to focus on. In terms of whether we can reverse out of it, uh, I have faith that, you know, our instincts are so strong about, you know, um, how to be with each other, that we will relearn those skills once we uh, get out of this. And we've just got time for one more, which um, we talked a bit about what people can do in their professional lives, investing lives, but just as a kind of something people can take away with them in your personal life, you know, what can an individual do to have a more balanced relationship with technology? I think we spoke before about, you know, turning off all your notifications is absolutely step one, which I have to say has made my life much, much calmer. It turns out I didn't really need to be, you know, mentally flicked in the on the forehead by my phone 9,000 times a day. Yeah. And, I, you know, at the end of the film, The Social Dilemma, there are these, these little recommendations and a lot of people compared that to The Inconvenient Truth, where you see this huge systemic problem of climate change. And then at the end, it tells you, so what can you do about it? And it says, turn off your light bulbs. So, you know, turning off notifications might feel like a small individual action. And, and it's right to point out that it is inhumane to take a systemically inhumane or broken system and put the burden of responsibility on individuals. In general, we obviously need to change these platforms to not be inhumane, but that's not to prevent ourselves, as you're saying, from taking the kinds of individual actions uh, that we can take. We can turn off all notifications. We can, um, if you want to escape the mind warps, something you could do is um, go to a family member who maybe has lived in a different filter bubble reality as you and actually do a reality swap. So open up Facebook on both your phones and actually switch phones, scroll through their feed for 10 minutes, and then ask the question, if I was living in that reality for the last 10 years, and look at the kind of things that are very different, because you'll notice immediately, we really overestimate the extent to which we've been looking at the same things. When you really step into someone else's reality, stepping into their, their meat suit, you know, Freaky Friday kind of world, um, and then reverse it over the last 10 years, you start to really gain empathy for why someone is feeling and thinking very different things from you. Uh, so that's something else you can do. Um, in general, just using this stuff a lot less. Um, you know, I think if everyone used social media very little, very intentionally, and with the uh, understanding that it fundamentally is warping your perception of the world and you need to discount everything you're seeing by that factor, I think, you know, we could live in a world that was compatible with social media if everyone had that consciousness. But if you look right now at just the degree of, again, uh, not just specific misinformation or fake news, but um, an entire process that has been so warping of us, we haven't considered that capacity. And I think we all just need to use it a lot less. Well, Tristan Harris, that was fascinating as ever. It's a real pleasure to speak to someone who is both so smart and so thoughtful on this subject. And thank you to the audience too for their questions. And best of luck with the fighting, fighting the good fight. Thank you for joining us.
Thank you so much, Helen. It's always a pleasure to talk to you.